We're privileged to have with us uh, at this special expanded meeting of the National Economic Council some of Nigeria's uh, most committed and valued philanthropic and development partners. Some of them, of course, as you know, are not Nigerians, but have become somewhat Nigerian by association. Uh, Mr. Bill Gates being one of them. Um, he, of course, as you've heard, represents the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, of course, Alaji Aliko Dangote and the Dangote Foundation. On behalf of the government and people of Nigeria, I thank you for being here with us today, and especially for the game-changing work that you have done here in Nigeria by uniquely deploying huge resources and innovation through social enterprise to solving some of the most challenging issues of development that we face today. Uh, Bill, your special interest in Nigeria and your attention to a lot of the development concerns that we have. Uh, you've been all over the country. You've seen, uh, as you've said yourself, so much of what has, has been done and what uh, remains to be done. And at various times, uh, you have uh, intervened in various ways and made huge investments. I think uh, that the encouragement that you give uh, consistently entitles you to speak to us frankly, as you've done today, as a brother. And uh, I must say that we are engaged fully, as a government in particular, and as governments in the various uh, states, to ensure that we are able to address some of these concerns. Let, let, let me reiterate that not only are we painfully aware of the issues uh, that you've outlined, and many that have already been spoken of, including what the Honorable Minister of Health uh, also uh, mentioned. But we are prepared to take on those challenges uh, head on, and indeed we have no choice, because the problem literally grows every day. Our population happens to be the largest in Africa, and one of the largest in the world. And in the next two decades, we will be, uh, some say the fourth, some say the third most populous country in the world. But Nigeria has strong uh, economic growth and development ambitions encapsulated in our Economic Recovery and Growth Plan, which we launched in 2017. All of those lofty ambitions can only be achieved through the determined application of human skill and effort. And for that effort to be meaningful and productive, it has to come from people who are healthy, educated, and who are and feel empowered. It is this realization that, at, that has helped us to ensure that one of the primary planks of our economic recovery and growth uh, plan is, quote, investing in people. And I think you pointed that out also in, in the comments that you made. And it is for this reason that we're expanding the reach and quality of our health care through the National Health Care Insurance Scheme and working to guarantee basic education for all persons whilst also upgrading and modernizing the quality of secondary and post-secondary education. And because of the nature of the times we're in, we know that it's important to ensure that our young people are prepared for the economies of the future. This means that STEM education is critical, science, technology, engineering, and maths, and that technology must lie at the heart of every one of our educational offerings. And I'll be talking about this very briefly as we go along. In 2016, we launched a social investment program comprising a job scheme for unemployed graduates, a feeding program for public primary schools, and a microcredit scheme for small businesses a cash transfer scheme for our poorest and most vulnerable households. We started with a million. This social investment program, which is a key component of our economic recovery and growth plan, is possibly the most ambitious in Nigeria's history. It aims to ensure, ultimately, that no one is left behind and that Nigeria's wealth is more equitably distributed to its vulnerable populations, the young and old, male and female, regardless of where in the country they live or what language they speak. Let me say a bit more about the uh, school feeding program because 
it's important as it addresses especially the issue of stunting. Now, the school feeding program is, of course, aimed at achieving better health, nutritional and educational outcomes for Nigerian children. And we're working closely with the Partnership for Child Development, which is the PCD, a research body that's based in the Imperial College, London, with a track record of supporting interventions that translate into healthier and better educated children. The school feeding program currently serves over 7 million school children across 22 uh, states of Nigeria and continues to grow as more states sign up for it. One of the important health outcomes, of course, is that it is meant to address malnutrition and stunting. When you're able to feed, give children one good meal a day uh, in school, there is, and for us, this is, this is a balanced meal because we're also concerned about the, ex, about the diet and about uh, the components of that particular meal. And so it's important, you know, as part of, our, of the efforts that we make, that we look at what the content of that food is also. And that, you know, helps us to address the major concerns around nutrition and stunting. There are, of course, also important educational and economic benefits to the school feeding program. By guaranteeing a hot meal a day for these children, the scheme has pushed school enrollment rates upwards in many of the communities in which it's been implemented. In fact, in several of the communities, we've seen over 30% increase in enrollment just because the children are being fed uh, in school. It's also helped to boost the local economies by ensuring that the food served to the children is sourced from local farmers who tend to be smallholder farmers and prepared and of course the food is prepared by local cooks. In many cases these farmers and cooks are the parents and guardians of the school children and so we are seeing uh, and what we are seeing is that the program is bringing whole scale benefit to low income households. The program, uh, the SIP, also has a strong monitoring and evaluation component that tracks not only the quality of the food that is being served, but also ensures that the intended outcomes are being delivered. Our cash transfer program, which we are delivering with the support of the World Bank, makes it imperative for beneficiaries to fulfill certain conditions related to health and education before they can receive their monthly stipends. These conditions range from mandatory antenatal care for pregnant women, to mandatory immunizations for nursing mothers, to minimum school attendance rates for parents of school-age children. So there is a connection between uh, the, the social investment program and the, the, the health outcomes we expect, the educational outcomes we expect. And as we hone uh, our programs and as, as we hone the way in which we are delivering these programs and as we ramp up the numbers we expect that this will have a, a tremendous impact on uh, the overall health outcomes and overall educational outcomes. NPA as is, is also one of the programs in our SIP. This is the jobs for graduate component of the social investment program and we deploy young Nigerians to work as health and teaching assistants, bringing health care and education to more people across the country. Already we have 200,000 young Nigerians who are engaged, and this year we intend to scale up by another 300,000. So we have 500 young Nigerians who are engaged as teaching assistants, who are engaged as health care assistants, and some of them who, are, who work uh, in, in, in farms, who are engaged uh, as um, who are engaged in farms and farm settlements, advising farmers. A lot of those have already been trained. We've trained about 20,000 so far, and we intend to ramp uh, that up as we go along. But more importantly, we are leveraging on the creativity and innovation of our young people. Last year, my office, in collaboration with the ICRC, launched the Northeast Makeathon, which is an exciting and creative, uh, hands-on co-creation program initiated to crowdsource and support brilliant and innovative ideas that can develop to scalable solutions to tackle in particular humanitarian challenges those faced especially in the IDP camps and other affected persons especially in the northeast of Nigeria. 
Since the launch of that program, we've had over 1,500 ideas, which we sourced from all over Nigeria. And we've identified six areas of the challenges. These are education, health, protection of, uh, of the camps, and uh, management, early recovery, and economic security, and in some cases, food security and nutrition. The participants came from all over the country. And these are all young people who are proposing interesting ideas and solutions to health, education, and any of these solutions can be scaled up and can work in any region of the country. I'll just give a few of the examples of some of the really innovative ideas that we've managed to get from these young people. There's a young man called uh, Kamal Sabili who invented something that he describes as a live box solution server a live box solution server. Now, this is a cost-effective online tool that enables students to browse over 20 million educational contents within the education sector, from primary to tertiary education levels. Livebox is free from bandwidth subscription and offers wireless access to digital knowledge from a local area network. So this is a, this is a simple invention that this young man has put together, and it enables you know, uh, access to such a wide variety of educational information, and it's offline. So there's no need for, you know, the kind of bandwidth constraints that we frequently have. There's another, there's a, a, a gentleman from Abuja, a young man from Abuja called Abdul Aziz Afiz, who invented what he described as Macaranta. Now, Macaranta is an offline tool and is a mobile application solely designed to transition the unschooled and the school dropout back into the formal schooling system. Now, Macaranta NG, as it, as it describes it, captures a strategy used already by not-for-profit uh, companies for over five years, which focuses on building the capacity of teachers to use child-specific lessons to prepare children who have been out of school from slum communities to transition into formal education. The focus is to create a learning space which which enables competent teachers who have a, you know, a bank of quality content to enhance the literacy, the numeracy, and digital life and life skills of the target groups, even in the most unconventional classrooms. So with this approach, each child in the IDP is treated as a unique learner who can learn at their own pace and are prepared to be enrolled into uh, the appropriate classes as they go along. So this is a very specific, uh, a very specific innovation, which we believe will be extremely helpful, especially as we scale it up for use in the IDPs and for use in slum communities, and especially designed to ensure that out-of-school children can get back into the into into the system, and you know because it's child-specific, because it's specific to the needs of individual children, it really does help. To, uh, to, to enable each child to learn without the constraint of peer pressure. The other, uh, there, there's another uh, innovation. This was designed by Zainab uh, Lawan, uh, a lady who was a particularly innovative, a particularly inspiring uh, a candidate. She came from Maiduguri to pitch her idea in Abuja. And her idea was a sanitary, uh, a sanitary uh, uh, device which she had. But on arriving uh, at Abuja the night before the event, she got a phone call that her father had died in, uh, in Maiduguri. So she went all the way back uh, to Maiduguri to be with her family. But by the very next day, she was back to, to just to ensure that she was able to pitch uh, for that event. And so for so many of us, it was an extremely uh, inspiring uh, an extremely inspiring thing. And this just shows you the, 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 the energy and the tenacity of a lot of the young people that we have. And this uh, was, in particular, a young lady who, as I've said, came uh, all the way from my degree. Now, what she, what, what she pitched was uh, what she called a ZDAL Dignity Kit. The Dignity Kit is an affordable sanitary kit designed to assist young girls and women in proper hygiene during their menstrual cycles and at delivery. So when, so she designed this, this, this particular kit to, to take care of young men, uh, young women, beg your pardon, and, to, and the emphasis 
on dignity is, is particularly important because these are this, this was designed for very poor uh, young uh, young women who at delivery or during their menstrual cycles need to be able to pay attention to, to, to standards of hygiene. Has, her invention was immediately picked up by the international development partners at the event. CARE and ICRC have already taken up that invention. The last, uh, uh, the last of those um, innovations that I will mention is one that was um, made by a group called SnapShield. There's a group of young men and women. And this is an uh, organic uh, water filtration system. The Snap, uh, the Snap Shield team, as they call themselves, uh, invented something that guarantees clean and drinkable water using a filtration system that uses soya bean chaff to filter water and making it suitable for drinking and other household uses. So they use soya bean chaff, which is of course available uh, uh, locally everywhere. And I've emphasized some of the innovation that we're seeing with these young people because, it, because we know that going forward, we cannot rely just on any for, on formal systems and on you know, the formal ways of solving these problems. We literally have to unleash the creativity and innovation of our young people to address the very huge problems that we, we, we are confronting that are, and we will confront in the years to come. In agriculture, a number of innovations have been introduced in the last few years. And we have seen crop yields rise as much as threefold to fourfold, bringing greater prosperity to smallholder farmers. Our rice revolution is a developing story, which we believe is worth paying attention to, in terms of the transformative effect that is having on rural economies across the country. When President Mohammed Buhari took office almost three years ago, uppermost in our minds as a government was how to ensure that our policies and programs were focused on improving the well-being of the people of this country. You might recall that previous years of high oil prices and economic growth had failed to translate to a better life for most Nigerians. And of course, you know, we've had the emphasis, we've talked about why, in many cases, grand corruption, waste and, and leakages, preventing investments in healthcare, and education and infrastructure and from, uh, from profiting any of these areas of our lives. But I think that the most important focus for us now is that we are completely determined to, to ensure that we make the kind of progress that will rewrite the story of our country. To put Nigeria's money to work for Nigerians, doing the most with the least that we earn. And we have stayed true to that vision. Even as oil prices went into free fall, we've ramped up investments in infrastructure, as well as our social spending. We are aggressively expanding government revenues by plugging leakages and widening the tax net to ensure that government is able to invest more in the things that matter. But I want to just emphasize that, especially with respect to spending on education and spending on healthcare, there are so many various uh, areas in which spending is going on. And I was speaking to the Minister of Finance about doing a desk review, just so that we can dimension the exact, how much exactly is being spent. There's a lot of private, there's a lot of private intervention. There's a lot of intervention at the level of government, local governments. In education, for instance, we have TED Fund, we have UBEC, we have several different, uh, we have several different places where money is being spent. I think it's important for us to dimension what exactly it is that we are spending on education and healthcare, so that we're able to spend smarter. Because in some cases you find overlaps, and in some cases you find that there is nothing going there whatsoever. So I think that the first thing, and uh, the Minister of uh, Finance has said that this is something that you'll be willing to do, is to dimension, that, uh, to dimension the exact quantum of the spending and also the, the, the areas where this is being spent, who is spending it, and how we, can, you know, how we can spend more smartly, and then look at how to ramp up the spending in a, in, in, in a manner that takes into account what is being spent is there already. Most importantly also, we're creating an enabling environment for the private sector to 
right? Succeeding at this means unleashing many more of the Alikoda motives with all uh, that represents for our growing economy, jobs, more jobs, and countless opportunities for the kind of world changing uh, philanthropy that uh, both Alikoda and the and Dr. Gates uh, have come to embody. We acknowledge that there is a lot of work ahead of us. Our education and health budgets at all levels of government are nowhere near optimal levels. But I can assure you that we possess the political will and vision to make the needed investments for today and for tomorrow, and that we are on the path of progress. It's also clear that we cannot and must not attempt to do it alone. That's why we are immensely grateful for the generous partnership of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Dangote Foundation, as well as our numerous uh, development partners who are here. We just heard from the uh, people of uh, DFID and, of course, Rashid of the World Bank, and so many of our development partners who have stood toe to toe with us in ensuring that we're able to deliver the human uh, development goals that we have set for ourselves. We'll continue to welcome uh, your support and also hope that it will inspire other partners at home and abroad to follow in your footsteps. We'll do everything in our part to ensure that you have the right environment for your transformational work. And we trust that we can continue to count on you as friends and partners well into the future. I thank you all very much for your